of this session is that we will have three speakers in a row with the primary question saved until a 15 minute opportunity at the end. So if the speakers end early, we may have the opportunity for a question or two, but in general, most of the questions and, and discussion will, will wait till the end of the three speakers. Yep. Good morning. I find this conference timely thinking that thermodynamics provides us with a comprehensive world, particularly of the world we view in this press of climate change, loss of biodiversity, and global scale pollution. So I'm grateful to the organizers for providing me this opportunity to re examine the foundations of thermodynamics and reveal the resulting climate disturbance. The laws of thermodynamics are thought to be reversed. However, while each law states a fundamental fact, none of them explain the specific fact. Specifically, the first law does not explain why energy is conserved. The second law does not explain why entropy never decreases. The third law does not explain why entropy tends to zero as the temperature approaches absolute zero. And the zero law does not explain why two systems in thermal equilibrium with a third one are also in equilibrium with each other. In the tradition of science, it is not a law, but a theory that explains. The law only states a fact and fear from it, whereas the theory provides a viewpoint to make sense of data. Moreover, a proper theory derives from an axiom, not from data. Consequently, the theory can be falsified with all of the data. In contrast, an effective theory, that is, a mathematical model, is matched with data and hence cannot be falsified with that data. So, what is the universal axiom that underlies the universal laws of thermodynamics? And this data. False and Willard Gibbs were after such an all encompassing thermodynamic view. They devised statistical mechanics, assuming everything comprises the same basic moving blocks. Boltzmann adopted this ancient atomistic axiom, also favored by Newton and Galileo. Surely, we know by today that the atom is not an indivisible permanent element. This was not new to Boltzmann either. The discovery of the electron proved the point already at the end of the 19th century. However, even the more recent discoveries of quarks and other subatomic particles do not invalidate the atomistic axiom, but only leave us ignorant about what is the fundamental element. Of course, we are not all. We can infer from phenomena such as annihilation and pair production of particles and antiparticles that everything comprises quantum of life. Indeed, in 1926, Gilbert Lewis renamed the light thinking that the photon is a universal atom, the constituent of everything. Already earlier, Isaac Newton had reasoned from emission and absorption that matter and light are convertible to one another. Nevertheless, one might think that the photon conservation would have been repeated long ago, since it is not stressed in textbooks. For example, in quantum field theory, the photons are created out of nothing and annihilated into nothing. However, the raising and lowering operators only mimic or model transitions from one state to another, but do not correspond to them. Namely, photons do not emerge from nothingness or vanish into nothingness but emit from matter and absorb into matter. Likewise, abstract space-time is not a true account of space, but a geometric model 
of the physical substance of space. The role of space cannot be disregarded in any theory because everything is immersed in it. Moreover, it's worth emphasizing that the Michelson Moore experiment did not mediate a light embodied hence relativistic with doesn't. On the contrary, it only disproved the light carrying medium, the lumina pyrrhus ether. So the vacuum cannot carry light, but still it can be light. Specifically, consider two photons paired out of phase. By pairing, these photons do not vanish altogether. They only cancel each other's electromagnetic effect. Such omnipresent substance is transparent and hence hard to detect. Yet you can sense space in terms of inertia and gravitation without sophisticated scientific instruments by the body. Most importantly, space bears the characteristics of a light like vacuum. The square speed of light is equal to the product of vacuum permittivity, and the square speed of light is also equal to the gravitation of all mass in the universe. This thermodynamic balance between the vacuum and all matter is a full proof that everything comprises photons. How else would the balance be gained if not by the exchange? A photon carries energy on its period, hence absorption and emission are means of attaining thermodynamic balance. Backed up with this insight of the axis of everything comprising photons, we proceed now to formulate statistical mechanics as the universal theory that underlies and explains the laws of Now. To this end, consider an energy level diagram where all entities are made of the same fundamental constituent. According, a transformation from one entity into another entails a change by at least one quantum. For example, a chemical reaction proceeds from substrates to products by either absorbing or emitting at least one quantum of light. Likewise, an electron may break into W minus boson and a neutrino, a one quantum particle. The axiom that everything comprises quantum is essential because it allows us to draw the general energy level diagram and formalize it as an equation of state, even without explicitly knowing the composition of entities. In a sense, this diagram presents all options while any specific system displays only a fraction of all quanta and only a limited set of transformations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, a cell accommodates a limited number of molecules and achieves a limited number of chemical reactions. Likewise, a star possesses a limited number of particles and performs a limited number of nuclear reactions. Yet the molecules and particles comprise photons and their reactions are fundamentally transformations of photons from one molecule or particle to another. Let us focus on one entity and ask what it takes for that entity to exist. Clearly the entity could not exist if any one of its ingredients were missing altogether. Thus, we may quantify the existence in terms of a mathematical product of the ingredients. The multiplicative form ensures that the probability of existence is zero if any one of the ingredients indexed with K is missing. Conversely, the probability of existence is high when the ingredients numbered by NK are numerous and the energy difference delta GJK between the K ingredients and the J product is small, then the balance can be shifted from the substrates toward the product 
find absorption for emission of photons with energy difference delta qj k. For example, sunlight drives the conversion of carbon dioxide and water into sugar and oxygen. Likewise, we may quantify the existence of a whole population of J products as a mathematical product. The most form ensures that the probability of that particular population is zero if any one of the J products is missing. For example, if any one of the photosynthesized sugar molecules is missing, the population of them is not exactly complete, so it does not exist properly. Here, the probability is divided by the factorial because the order of indistinguishable members is immaterial. Finally, we may quantify the existence of a whole system comprising various entities as a mathematical product over all population. Again, the multiplicative form ensures that the probability is zero if any one population indexed with J is missing. For example, if any one population of the numerous molecules making a cell is missing, the cell does not exist exactly like the whole system. It follows from the all-inclusive action that the presented formalism is general. It applies to any system and any transformation from elementary particle reaction to the expansion of the universe, from a chemical reaction to biosphere, from a small purchase to world trade. Probability is an all encompassing concept. It counts all parts of the system. However, we are used to additive methods instead of product form. So let us take a logarithm of the product to obtain a sum. For historical reasons, the sum is known as entropy when multiplied with Boltzmann constant, KB. For the same reason, the average energy is known as temperature multiplied by KB. This equation of entropy multiplied with temperature is the state equation. It expresses the energy bound in the entities numbered in J and the energy given by differences, the delta terms. This energy is free for the populations of entities which to change, and so they will. Taking the coin derivative from the state equation yields the equation of motion. It shows that free energy drives changes from one state to another until free energy is consumed altogether. Then, yeah. at the thermodynamic bound, entropy is maximum as all energy is bound in the population. By a continuous equation of motion, by replacing the discrete chemical potential with continuous scalar potential, and likewise the discrete dissipation with continuous vector potential, and substituting the total energy with kinetic energy. 
A continuous equation of notion can be derived from the Newton second law in its complete form as well, where the force equals a change in momentum by multiplying it with velocity. At the stationary state, dissipation vanishes and evolution reduces to steady state circulation, known as the visual theory, where the kinetic energy balances the potential energy. Thus, the equation of state and the equation of motion derive from the axiom of everything comprising what reproduces the family formula of stationary physics. Finally, it is perhaps worthwhile to take a glimpse at quantum statistics as well. The renowned distribution of photons can be derived from the energy level diagram of the vacuum. Here, photons distribute along the trains of paired photons that comprise the vacuum. Again, the probability contains the exponential term to express that the high energy photons are rare and that the low energy ones are abundant. As there are two options for each locus, there is the factor of two in the denominator. Then working out the stationary state the equation yields the family distribution of most Einstein statistics. Let us now summarize how the equation of state and the equation of motion explain the fundamental facts stated by the laws of thermodynamics. First, energy is conserved because its carriers, the photons, are permanent. On the other hand, energy is not conserved because the photon shifts frequency as it propagates from one medium to another. For example, the photon shifts red when it propagates to a weaker gravity. So the true fact is that photons are conserved, not energy. Second, entropy cannot decrease because free energy can only decrease. Squaring free energy by inserting the rate equation into the equation of motion proves the point. So the true fact is that everything evolves toward balance, where entropy is maximum and free energy is zero. Third, when the temperature tends to absolute zero, also entropy tends to zero because entropy is a function of energy. Physically speaking, entropy vanishes when energy vanishes because entropy enumerates entities that carry energy. Forever redshifting photons affords nothing. So, the true fact is that energy does not exist as such, but is always embodied in photons. Finally, the zeroth law about the new is inevitable. Two systems end up in thermodynamic balance when energy flows to a third one. So the true fact is that everything depends on everything else. In this way, statistical mechanics of open systems explains the laws of thermodynamics, but more important, it explains observation. So what do the observations tell us? Quite remarkable. They look all the same, irrespective of scale and scope. Specific, it has been noticed ever since Galilei that central parts of the signal curves follow straight lines on log log scales. In other words, power laws are ubiquitous. The sigmoid curves, in turn, sum up skewed distributions, and statistical mechanics make sense of the skew in distribution. It is a consequence of the least time free energy consumption. This is proved by expressing an entity as a product of the fundamental elements and taking a logarithm. Then variation in the number of fundamental elements is seen as log normal, that is skewed. 
fat tails extend way beyond normal distribution. For example, by the normal distribution, big fists are bigger than expected from the average fist. The reason is obvious. The biggest fish produce the most egg, whereas the smallest ones get eaten up. The imperative to attain balance from the least point drives the flows of quanta to functional structures such as fish. Thus, the emergence of animals can be understood to follow from the quest to attain balance from the least point. For a flourish, for matter to gain balance with sun. For a forest to gain balance with flora. Likewise, the emergence of economic machinery can be understood as a manifestation of gaining balance with the supplies in the surroundings. Fossil fuels are extracted for economies to gain balance with their energy costs. The skewed distribution of energy construction mechanisms is often when it channels flows of energy in the least point. Accordingly, the most effective means are scarce as they are costly. Conversely, the least effective ones are abundant as they are inexpensive. Speaking in biological terms, this least time quest resulting in various skewed distributions displays itself in competition and collaboration. However, these are not exclusive characteristics of ecosystems and economic systems, but likewise, also physical systems display competition of opposing forces and cooperation of parallel ones. For the same least time reason, standards and conventions emerge as means to consume free energy. For example, amino acids are not mixed handed, but single handed because protein synthesis using standardized substrates provides faster consuming free energy. Likewise, assembly lines require standardized pieces. Moreover, for the same reason as we shake hands with our right hand, we use right handed screws and we drive on the same side of the road. Otherwise, things would not work. That is, free energy would not be consumed effectively. Likewise, we may reason that matter dominates over antimony matter to make things work. For example, the standard of matter allows nuclear reactions to happen. Intriguingly, the derived equations also disclose that evolution toward thermodynamic balance is a non deterministic process. Future wise open as the equations are non integrable. Motions cannot be separated from their driving force. In line with our own experience, opportunities to consume free energy open up while others close in as the system evolves what from one state to another. The paths can be calculated exactly only at the balance where energy is conserved. Now that statistical mechanics derived from the atomistic axiom, Pamela de Fulton delivers thermodynamics consistently with data and in agreement with common sense. It seems somewhat puzzling why did Boltzmann not formulate it? Why did he end up with statistical mechanics that applies only to stationary or closed systems? What went wrong? It seems that, on the one hand, knowing in advance the state of balance, Boltzmann forced the condition of balance instead of recognizing the forces that drive the system toward balance. After all, Boltzmann had derived the renowned velocity distribution of gas motors. So he knew the outcome of the evolution of the thermodynamic of Weber. Accordingly, his equation is devoid of free energy without the photon. 
that either absorb or emit in any transformation. Moreover, Boltzmann might have also been after an inevitable equation. In other words, he might have been biased toward the deterministic equation of motion. Perhaps he did not even consider that nature is non deterministic, yet not indeterministic, that is, random. On the other hand, Boltzmann recognized the statistical nature of motion as he employed probability concept. However, he erred by adopting random a causal symmetrical distribution instead of non deterministic causal skewed distribution. While the Gaussian distribution is convenient for calculus, it is not an accurate account of reality. Natural processes are not arbitrary, but forced toward values in the worst point. Therefore, the distributions emerge with skew. The least time quest to consume free energy can be understood as natural selection. Bosman was after this insight, but failed to put Darwin's words in thermodynamic terms. Today, we might think of from biological to universal as other or this step. However, Darwin himself generalized natural selection from artificial selection, that is, breeding selected by man. Moreover, Darwin did not recognize any boundary between animal and human. In a letter to Joseph Booker, Darwin wrote, if we could conceive in some warm little form with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salt, light, heat, electricity, etc., present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. So, troubles in thermodynamics originate from Boltzmann failing to formulate statistical mechanics properly and from his successors accepting <clears> the <throat> theory. Subsequent attempts to expand the stationary state evolutionary formulation could not have caused obscurity. In contrast, the presented evolutionary equation naturally limits to the stationary state where the balance has been attained. Conversely, it is eye open to many abiologists that evolution is nothing but happening. Quanta carry energy on their periods of time, thus the flow of quanta embodies the flow of time. However, the flow is not arbitrary, but takes the course of this point, equivalent to the maximum free energy consumption. Among the common misconceptions, particularly problematic is the association of increasing disorder with increasing entropy. By common sense, this order, just like order, is not a cause but a consequence of evolution toward a balance. For example, think of this ordered water freezing to orderly ice to attain balance with cold surroundings. Likewise, over the eon, the inanimate matter has assembled and organized into biota to gain balance with the high energy insulation. Moreover, consider Shannon's concept of information entropy. It treats information as if it was immature. However, no information exists without embodiment. By common sense, information is free energy. It enables motion, evolution to work balance. All this might seem naive compared with sophisticated theorization. Even so, what is real is compelling in the end. A paradigm shift entails a shift in perspective, a change in the phenomena of themselves. For the proposed axiomatic perspective, phenomena follow one and the same principle. It is about asking why things happen 
and answer it. Motion follows force. A rock falls down. A plant grows toward the light. It is also about asking how things happen and answer it. Motion takes the path of least time. For example, rock falls straight down. A plant grows straight to the light. Of course, it seems for him to press that the new perspective ought to be precise in its prediction. As usual, the precision increases by including, including error finer details. However, precise predictions, as explained, are unreal because motion affects its driving forces and so on. Only steady-state motions are computable. Also, predictions in the past have, in fact, been calculations of this kind rather than true prophecy. For example, a closed orbit can be calculated, whereas an open trajectory remains in track. Complexity is not the optical perceived. For example, the problem of three bodies is inherently practical because everything depends on everything else. In conclusion, science is supposed to make sense of reality. Sense means comprehension through our own senses. This empirical stance may seem unwarranted as our eyes register only a narrow band of the electromagnetic spectrum, our ears only a slim strip of vibrational spectrum, and our nose and mouth only a small assortment of molecules and our skin only a limited range of temperatures and pressure. However, regardless of scale and scope, data look all the same and warn relating any phenomena to our experience. To this empirical end, the axiom of everything comprising photons allows us to formulate an all-encompassing theory. Not too surprisingly, the holistic DNA underlies the universal laws of thermodynamics. Most importantly, the derived equation in motion reveals the sense of explanation, namely causality. A force is a cause, and a change in state is a consequence. So we should strive to sense forces, whatever kind, to navigate along their result. Otherwise, Dismissed dynamics, now evident in climate change, the loss of biodiversity, and global scale pollution will put us in peril. Science complies facts about nature, but at its best, science revises our aberrant thoughts about nature into those that are natural. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, <clears throat> Arta. That was that was an awesome introduction for the for the conference. <clears throat> we do have time for a few questions. If you can, um, if you can raise your hand and and then uh, we will get a some time for a question or two before we uh, switch speakers. I think actually there was a question in the in the chat that you <clears throat> gave a, a one word answer to. I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit. Yes, uh, I agree that information is is free energy. It's like food. It has the same role in thermodynamic terms. So I in a in a sense I protest Shannon for formulating an information concept that is devoid of embodiment. That is to say, as if information would be without any substance, which I regard as unnatural. So therefore I would find it more uh, realistic to say that all information is embodied in some form of substance and substance is essentially food. 
And you have a, another question in the chat to elaborate on how entropy is not conserved. Well, entropy, as I explained, is uh, a form of energy. It is a function of, of energy, bound and free forms of energy. So if one says that energy is conserved, then one would think that entropy is conserved. However, as we see, energy is not conserved. Systems dissipate energy. The whole universe is also uh, going down with its energy density. Therefore, I can't see any reason that entropy ought to be conserved because energy is not conserved. And one more in the in the chat, I wonder, it's probably easier for you to read and respond. Yeah, I can see that there is a question where I equate the mass multiplied with gravitational constant with the speed of light squared and, and multiplied with the, the radius of the universe, the observable radius of the universe. Well, this equation is really, how would I say, we have this relativistic formula where the mass multiplied with the square of light equals the gravitational potential of the whole universe. So that's this equation. You can of, of course also express this in terms of uh, energy density or mass density, and that equals the energy density of the uh, vacuum. So we can take it as an experimental fact as well. Also, you can say that this equation stems from Noether's theorem, M. B. Noether's first theorem that states that the number of quanta in the whole universe equals the energy of the universe multiplied with the age of the universe. So these fundamental facts about the constituents of the whole universe are stated in this way. It's a balance of, of uh, the vacuum energy and the energy in all matter. Thank you. <clears throat> and if we haven't before, perhaps it is a good time to thank our speaker again, um, whether you do so <clears throat> out loud or, or with uh, re reactions from Zoom. Um, much appreciated. <clears throat> we will pause and have an opportunity for more questions after the, the third speaker.